appreciate that intro. Let me share my desktop here. And uh, you stole my my you stole my opening. I was gonna say the same thing. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, no matter uh, where you're at. It is really awesome to have you here. I appreciate you joining me, and I hope you have been enjoying the conference so far uh, here at JCon. Wish we could be together in person, but this is the next best thing. So let's jump right into it. So this is my session. It's going to be a little bit probably different than some of the other sessions you might see here. It's really, really fun. I enjoy giving this session. I enjoy talking about this topic. It's got just tons of different things that I've touched in technologies and hardware and software and clouds and all kinds of amazing things. So let's jump right into it. So this is my session. I call it brain to the cloud, but the kind of official title is examining the relationship between brain activity and video game performance. So a little bit about me. This is me, the same guy here that you see here in that picture. That's me. I'm a full stack developer. I have been so since 2004. So 18 years now. Uh, I currently work as a principal developer advocate. I'm employed by Twitch. Twitch is owned by Amazon. I advocate for a service called Amazon Interactive Video Service. Amazon IVS is the service that powers Twitch itself. It is the live streaming service that uh, we offer as an AWS service that you could use to integrate live streaming into your application. We're gonna look a little bit at live streaming today, not a whole lot, but if you're interested in that topic and wanna to learn more about it, please connect with me on Twitter, check out my blog uh, or connect up with me on LinkedIn. And I'd be glad to tell you more about Amazon Interactive Video Service. So in this session, you're going to learn how I uploaded my brain to the cloud so that I could analyze my video game performance. And you're probably asking yourself, why on earth would you do such a thing? Um, and that's a fair question. It's a great question, right? So uh, a while back, I found a blog post and it showed how to hack this device called a MindFlex. And this is a MindFlex right here, I'll show you. So this, this little headset here is called a MindFlex. And it is a, it's actually a toy uh, made for kids that you can put on this headset headband and connect it up to a little base station. And just through the power of your brain, through the power of your mind, you could make these balls levitate on this base station, right? So if you concentrate really hard and focus really, really attentive, uh, you could make this ball levitate. And it was kind of sold. It, there was a few different versions of it. One of them if you're a Star Wars fan, one of them was called a force trainer, which is actually pretty clever, right? I mean, you you know, you use the force to to make this this uh, the item move with your head, with your brain, with your force powers. Um, so, anyways, it was kind of a gimmicky thing. They're they're rather old too. I mean, I think they first came out uh, ten years ago, maybe maybe even longer. Um, but they actually. They actually contain a really a legitimate EEG chip, um, which I found kind of surprising. And actually, let me show you here. This is actually what the, the internals of it is. Uh, I have a, a little chip. This is an actual legitimate EEG chip. Um, it's called a T-Jam, T-G-A-M. Uh, and it, it's actually a legitimate EEG chip. So. The surprising thing again was that this children's toy contained this legitimate chip. And this blog post that I found had gone and hacked this device and added an Arduino and output the brain waves and did some charting and things like that. So I read this article, I thought it was really cool. And I thought I would love to do that. But instead of like, instead of trying to like move something with my brain or cause some kind of action, what if I could instead compare my brain activity, my focus, my attention, my uh, meditation, things like this, what if I could compare that to some sort of action? And 
I love playing video games. I know there there was some access to certain statistics that I could obtain via the Call of Duty API and some of the other uh, ways of scraping my statistics. And I thought, well, what if I wore this thing while playing video games? What would it show me? Would it would it show that I really, really focused? I have a really good game. Um, would it show that if I'm tired or or really calm or uh, you know, not paying attention in some way, do I have a really bad game? Is there any way to like quantify this? Is there, is it, or is it just going to be like total gibberish nonsense and not make any sense whatsoever? But I was really intrigued and really curious. So I decided to kind of do this project where I wore this thing and I captured my brain data and I played some games and I combined everything up in the cloud and tried to answer some of these questions. So I got to it and I started hacking this device per this blog post. And um, the really kind of cool thing is that this MindFlex device has serial output pins inside of it. And these developers that wrote this original blog post figured out that all of that brainwave data is actually output to that serial, those serial pins. So all you had to do was read those serial pins and do a little bit of deciphering and you had the brain data. And so the original blog post they use an Arduino device, which is rather large. I mean, they're probably uh, uh, two inches. Uh, I'm not sure how many centimeters that is, but they're rather large. Actually, they're, they're honestly about the size of this device here. And they actually, in the blog post, they cable tied, strapped it to the, to the side of the device. And really it took up pretty much the whole side of it. Um, I wanted to be a little more kind of elegant, a little more cleaner with my solution. So I used what's called an ESP12 chip. And as you see in this picture here, it's this tiny chip and it has onboard Wi-Fi. And, and they're actually, this is the chip itself. I mean, it's about the size of my eyeball, uh, about the size of a, a postage stamp for an envelope. And it has everything that I needed to take care of reading the data and connecting up to a Wi-Fi access point and publishing that data out to the cloud. So let's talk about the architecture of the product project. Obviously, you have my brain, my brain being the source of all the brain data. And what I would do is take that data, collect it with that ESP12 chip on the MindFlex, and publish that data to an MQTT broker in the cloud. Now this MQTT broker would listen for all of those kind of act as the, basically as the broker, messaging broker between my brain, the SP12 device and the cloud application. So if I'm wearing this MindFlex and I'm publishing this data, it's all going up to this MQTT broker. If there's nothing connected on the other end, that's fine. The messages are just kind of tossed, thrown away. But when the cloud application, the Java Micronaut application is up and running, it has an MQTT consumer. It consumes all of that data and persists it to a database. We're going to look at that code in just a second. Finally, the Call of Duty statistics are consumed via the Java application as well and persisted into the database. And once I have all that brain data, once I have all that game data, I'm able to combine that do some charting, do some reports and those kind of things to figure out if my brain is related to my video game activity. So let's do a quick demo of the device just so you can kind of see how it works. This is a lot more fun to do in person at a conference because obviously I'm able to bring somebody up from the crowd and, and play with them but that's okay, I will wear it myself and show you how it works. So if I put this device on, it can be a little tricky, a little finicky, and um, sometimes have a hard time getting a perfect connection, but I've tested it out this morning and everything seems to be working really, really good today. I've got some fresh batteries in it, and so we should have no problems with this demo. So I put the device on, I have an external power via USB that powers the uh, ESP12 chip. And I just did that because I had found that 
the battery supply for the headset itself wasn't really enough to drive both the headset and the ESP12 ESP12 chip. So I provided the external power via a little USB power bank. And if I plug that in, you can see that I've powered the device. And if I turn the device on, in just a second, excuse my my uh, my hair there, but in just a second, you can see a blue flashing LED here. That indicates that my data is all being published up to the cloud. So if I reload this page here, make sure I'm logged in. And if I connect up to that, we can see in real time, I'm starting to get some data. In this case, I do have not a perfect connection. And that is because my signal strength is only 75. What I'm looking for here is a 100. So if I, oh, I didn't connect the ear probe. So if I do that, we will see, I just tell that into it really quick. Still not a perfect reading. Ah, I think we're getting close. All right, perfect. So now that we have 100% signal strength and it'll kind of vary in and out because again, it's a 10 year old kid's toy. It's not the greatest and most reliable EEG device, but after you wear it for just a little bit of time, it gets a really good connection. It tends to stay really solid. So you can see here that uh, a couple things. My current attention level is very, very low. I'm not sure why that is. I actually have never seen a attention stay that low for that long, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. But I promise you, I am paying attention to this presentation and all of you. Uh, my current meditation is very, very high, which again is kind of odd and kind of not very normal. But um, it is what it is. This is what my readings are at this moment. I must be mightily distracted because my current attention level is currently at a one and very, very low. But essentially, this is, uh, and, and here's the raw brain data. So all my delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma waves are charted in real time. Uh, I'm not a brain expert, so I can't tell you exactly what all of these numbers mean. There is a uh, explanation over here on the side of the page. So for example, delta waves are related to sleep. Uh, alpha waves dominate during moments of quiet thought and similar meditative states. So there is some explanations there for you. As you can see, my attention level is sort of climbing a little back up. But the, the really cool thing is that it's charted in real time. And these are actually, I mean, as I said, this is going through the MQTT uh, broker directly up to the Micronaut application and sent to the browser via WebSockets in real time. So uh, kind of cool, kind of fun demo. We'll look at another piece of that in just a second. But uh, for now, I will disconnect that. I will come back to our slides. And we will talk about the Arduino client. So the Arduino client is really not that difficult at all. We'll take a quick look at the code here. And um, won't spend too much time on it because this is C++ and this is a Java conference, so not exactly on topic, but I did think it was kind of interesting. So the brain library is a dependency that I include, which I got from the uh, original blog post, the, the authors of that post published this brain library. And what this does is essentially, it just reads the serial port from the MindFlex and converts the raw data into some actual human readable data. So it's kind of handy and kind of nice. I have an ESP MQTT client library, and I just pass that my SSID, my password, my MQTT credentials, and that will connect and configure a ESP uh, client that I could use to, an MQTT client that I could use to publish a uh, up to 
the MQTT broker. And if we scroll down here down to the loop method, inside the loop method, you can see here on 112 that I can read the signal quality and the attention values, the meditation. So all of the individual values off of the MindFlex, I'm able to read. I store those into an object, I serialize that object as JSON, and then I publish that up to the MQTT broker. Um, if we actually connect to the broker right now, we should be able to actually view that in real time. So this is the actual MQTT broker. And you can see these JSON objects being published up to that broker uh, as they come in from the MindFlex device. So it's kind of nice that uh, we can view that directly from our command line and see that the data is being published to that broker. <clears throat> so that's the Arduino client. client. Let's take a look now at the Micronaut application. Let me take this off for just a second. And we will jump into the Java code. So assuming, hoping that you're all somewhat familiar with Micronaut, we will take a look at the Micronaut application. So the first piece of the Micronaut application that I wanted to show you is this recent games class. And what this is, is my way of on a scheduled basis, in this case, every hour, uh, this is how I get my Call of Duty statistics from the Call of Duty API. So I have this COD auth client and I have a get match details method within that. And if we take a look at the get match details method, we can see here that I'm taking advantage of Micronaut's declarative HTTP client feature. And this is a really cool feature to me. So um, Micronaut gives us the ability to create a interface and basically create a, a HTTP client out of an interface that points at a specific API endpoint. So in this case, we can add all of these different header annotations for all of the different header values that are required for the API. If we need authentication, we can do that. And then we just create a signature for every single method that we want, every single endpoint that we want to hit. And within that method signature, pass the required uh, attributes, and we can plug, which are plugged in to the URL when uh, we make the call to that endpoint. Now, the nice thing about this is I'm sure you've all done some work with HTTP clients and HTTP calls in Java. Even with the latest and greatest HTTP client, you probably know that it's a lot of work and a lot of code, and it's kind of all typically boilerplate and kind of redundant, repetitive type calls just to make post gets, puts, patches, deletes to certain endpoints. <clears throat> The nice thing about Micronaut is that we can create these interfaces and at compile time, Micronaut will actually implement all of the necessary code to actually make these calls at runtime. So just by providing the necessary values in this interface, we get all of that done for us ahead of time and at, done at compile time so that uh, we don't have any runtime performance penalties or issues with that. So that's how I get my match details. And uh, all of my game statistics are then, I just loop over that. I persist those all to the database. Uh, the other nice thing is the fact that I'm actually using Micronaut data, which is a really easy way to persist um, data to a database. In this case, I declare a class. I uh, assign different properties to that. I create a repository in Micronaut like this. And again, all at compile time, all of the necessary code to create my persistence tier <clears throat> is done. And I can take advantage of that at runtime. Now, 
let's jump over to the MQTT subscriber. So this class is annotated with MQTT subscriber. It's called the BTTC consumer. And what this does is has a specific method annotated with topic. And this is the actual topic that I'm publishing to from the MQTT uh, side on the Arduino. So it's just the same topic. I just essentially annotate it with the name of the topic. And every time a message is received on that topic, this method will be called. So inside of this method, I simply deserialize the map data, the object data from MQTT into a POJO, which is again, uh, using Micronaut data for persistence. And then I call save async to persist that to the database. So every single message that comes in from the MQTT broker is persisted to the database. This code here, we're gonna take a look at in just a minute. So we'll skip over that for now. But essentially, I've got all my game data coming in on a scheduled task, persisted to my database every hour. And while I'm playing, all of my brain data is also persisted via the MQTT kind of pub sub kind of process. So I've got brain data and I've got game data. Obviously the challenge now is combining that data and actually finding out if anything meaningful came from that. So to do that, I used a bit of SQL. So the first thing we can take a look at here is the fact that all of my game data is stored as JSON, which is really nice because to me, that data comes in from the API as JSON. It's, um, I don't have control over that data. The Call of Duty, obviously, uh, Activision has control over that data and it could change. So if I were to create an actual schema based on the JSON and create some tables and columns and properties uh, or, or data types bound to those columns, that would work just fine. It would make my life uh, a little easier, a little more difficult ahead of time, but it would make things a little easier. But uh, again, it's less flexible. What happens if they change a column? What happens if they remove a column? What happens if they add a column? I'm kind of stuck having to manage that schema from now on. If I use JSON, I have that flexibility to just insert however the data, however it comes in from the Call of Duty API. But I also have the flexibility to query it um, with SQL and break all of those values out of the JSON object. So here's an example of doing just that. So in this case, by uh, referencing the basically dot notation of the JSON object, I'm able to query the JSON object and pull all of that data out and make it look like a normal tabular kind of data format that we're kind of used to seeing with SQL. So what did I do with that? Well, uh, to me, it made the best sense to create a materialized view out of that data. Uh, and this materialized view would allow me the, give me the ability to do kind of query it directly as a table um, in that kind of normal, almost uh, normalized format that you, you would be used to seeing it. And it would also refresh and keep things up to date. So now that I have my game data, the next thing I needed to do was query my brain data. So to do that, this is what a query looks like to uh, query my brain data. So now I've got game data. I've got it in a materialized view in a normalized kind of fashion, columns and rows, everything looks good. And I've got brain data. How do I combine these two data uh, elements? Well, the only real way to do that was to use the dates. So the start date of the game, uh, basically join that to the basically minimum timestamp of my brain data and the end date of the game, join that to the last timestamp of the brain data. And once I was able to do that, I was able to summarize things. Um, oops. 
I was able to summarize things by the actual uh, attention level, by the meditation level, and able to get summaries and things like that. So how could this possibly be any cooler? Well, as I told you, back in the summer, I started working as a developer advocate for Amazon IBS, which is a live streaming technology that allows you to create your own live streams and do really cool things with them. So I thought the best way to do that, make, it, make this demo even cooler, was to actually add a live streaming element. So if you're familiar with gaming, you probably know that Twitch and live streaming gameplay is quite a popular thing. So what I did was I created a live stream channel with Amazon IVS, and I used a feature called timed metadata, which gives you the ability to inject metadata into your video stream at a very specific point in time. So if we kind of come back to the consumer and take a look at that, we can see that I have this put meta metadata request and I use the Amazon IVS client to publish metadata every single time I receive a message on that MQTT topic. So not only am I persisting that to the database and broadcasting it to the WebSocket front end so that the live demo can view it, but I'm also sending it as a timed metadata packet along with my video stream uh, that I'm about to show you. So if we come over here to OBS and we start streaming and we come over to this live stream demo and reload the page, we can see that my video is being live streamed to the uh, demo page. And those same charts that I showed you on the live demo are being populated in real time on this page as well. So you can imagine, maybe I've created my own live streaming website for gamers and they're wearing this device and they're actually streaming live brain data over their live stream while they're playing the game. So this could kind of be a really cool thing. People could tune in, watch my current attention level. You could enhance it maybe with heart rate. It's just a really powerful to me example of how you can uh, really enhance your live streams with features like timed metadata. So uh, that is the live stream demo. Um, I will quickly show you this because um, it's kind of neat, and then we'll get to the results. So um, a couple of weeks ago, I kind of got tired of messing with this MindFlex, and I found this uh, what's called a Muse headband, which is much newer, much more reliable. And so I have, if I turn that on, I've created this other demo which also allows me to broadcast my brain data. But this time it's a much easier method of using web Bluetooth, connecting that up to the broadcast and then coming over to the playback side of things and seeing my brain data broadcast in real time. So it's the same demo essentially but this headband is much easier to wear, much more reliable, much faster, and allows me to do that same demo, but in a much kind of easier to read, easier to understand format. There's a blog post coming on this. If you're interested in learning more about that, it should be coming out next week. So just a little sidebar on that. So let's talk about the results, right? Uh, I spent 21 hours playing 150 matches and collected, I think, 12,000 records of brain data and actual uh, 
actual brain data and game data while wearing this device. And uh, what I found was the results were kind of interesting. So I wanted to show you this page first because um, as I broke out all of the results, I started noticing that most of my time was spent in the 41 to 60% range. You can see here about 17 and a half hours was spent in the 41 to 60% range. Um, very little time was spent in the 61 to 70% attention range, even less time in the 71 to 80 and 21 to 30% range. So the majority of my data kind of fell in that middle range. And if you look at this chart, this is not an actual chart, but this was kind of how I thought the data was going to come out, right? I kind of figured that if we consider the left, uh, the y-axis being my uh, game kill death ratio, my actual kind of how well I did in the match, and the x-axis being the attention range, I kind of figured that I would have this linear progression of performance. Uh, in other words, the less I paid attention, the worse I did, the more I paid attention, the better I did. I kind of figured that this would how the trend line would go. In actuality, my performance started out really poor at low levels. It started to grow when my attention was at 31 to 40%, and it peaked when my attention was at the 41 to 50% range. And then it slightly dropped in that 51 to 60% range. But as you can see back here, um, I spent nine hours and 23 minutes in that range. So uh, it actually started dropping even further, but again, those were really small sample sizes. So if we look at my uh, score per minute, it kind of follows that same trend, starts off low, uh, goes a little higher, then at 41 to 50 peaks, and then drops at 51 to 60%. And if we look at my kills per minute, follows the same trend again, low, rises, peaks, and then kind of drops off. My accuracy also follows that same trend. So what does that tell me? Well, when I started thinking about it, it kind of actually made sense because if you play video games, you, you kind of know and you kind of understand that video games are really reactive. Uh, when you do really well, you don't really focus and pay attention. You just kind of react to what you see on the screen. If you tried really hard, if you tried to pay attention and, and look at every single thing and every, everywhere all of your enemies are, and um, if you actually kind of over try, you tend to do a lot less, uh, not as well as you do when you just kind of take in the, the scene, uh, really don't focus on one particular uh, part of the screen. You just kind of um, almost kind of open your brain and open your eyes and just kind of absorb and react to everything that you're seeing on the screen. So to me, it kind of made sense. It's like, okay, when my accurate, when my attention is fairly medium, I do really well. When it's low, I do poorly. When it's overly, when I'm overly focused, overly paying attention, I don't do as well either. So it's kind of that middle range that I do the best in. Let's take a look at the meditation value. So again, I spent a lot of time in the 41 to 50% range, 51 to 60%, uh, I spent 15 hours, 61 to 70%, I spent two hours, and then only 15 minutes in the 71 to 80% range. So what does the data show here? Well, again, my kill death ratio uh, on the left-hand side on the y-axis and my meditation range on the x-axis, you could see that the more calm that I am, the worse that I do, right? So if we look at this, the 41 to 50% range, I'm 41 to 50% calm. If I'm 51 to 60% calm, my performance goes down. If I'm 61 to 70% range, my performance goes down again. What about my average score? Same trend. At 41 to 50, does really well. 51 to 60 goes down, 61 to 70 goes down again. Score per minute. All of these individual factors follow the same exact trend of the uh, high value, 
start decrease all the way down to low value. Now, what does this tell me? Well, what, to me, what this tells me is the less calm that I am, the better I do. Now, why is that? Well, um, it kind of makes sense again to me, because if you think about it, if I'm really, really tired, then I'm probably not going to do as well. And if I'm really, really tired, then I'm probably more calm than I'm not calm, right? So it all kind of makes sense when you think about the data and look at it as kind of from a logical perspective. The less calm that I am, the better I do. The more calm that I get, the kind of less focused I am, less reactive that I am. So um, that's the data compared to the meditation. Now, if we look at things combined and we kind of see where I do best when both factors come into play, you can see here that my if we if we just kind of compare the values together and look at meditation versus attention uh, and compare my performance against those two factors, when my meditation is around 53%, my attention is around 70, I tend to do the best. Um, the problem with this chart, the thing that I don't like about this chart <clears throat> is that it, it doesn't include any factor for amount of time spent in range. So that could have been one match that I was in both of those ranges and did really well. Um, so what I did here was I actually weighted these values based on the time spent in those ranges. And based on the weighted values, the best performance that I had was when my, again, my attention was in the 50% range and my meditation was around 56%. Uh, and my second best time was right in that same area. My weighted values that are outside of those, whether I'm really high in attention or really low in calmness, um, you can see those values, what they look like here. And the same with my average score compared to my attention and meditation. So um, that chart shouldn't be there. Sorry about that. So essentially, uh, that is the presentation. Uh, there's a lot of blog posts that you can check out. You can actually go to bttc.toddrsharp.com if you want to look at some of the various charts and reports and read some of the, the uh, write-ups that I've put out there about this project. And if you want to learn more about interactive video service, you could check out ivs.rocks. Here are my socials and contact information if you'd like to connect. And I really appreciate everyone joining me here. So if there's any questions, I'll be glad to uh, answer them. Let me check out the chat. And I don't seem to see any questions. So, okay. This, <laughs> this reminded me in the first half of one of the Iron Man movies where there's a bad scientist who's showing Pepper his giant brain. Really enjoyable and interesting talk. Thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, it was a fun talk. It is a lot more fun to do this talk in person because uh, I'm able to get folks who are interested up on stage and, and hook these awesome devices up to their brain. But uh, yeah, if you want to check out any of the code, um, you can check out GitHub. You can check out my write-ups again. Uh, if I go to the previous slide here, uh, check out any of those blog posts on recursive.codes. All of the code, everything is kind of summarized in a much more detailed fashion. Uh, there's actually three really long blog posts and three uh, accompanying YouTube videos that I kind of have created to really go into depth about some of this. So um, if you're interested in learning more, check those out. And uh, again, thank you everyone for coming. Appreciate you having me.